Welcome to another edition of the Hawk Off the Press podcast. I'm your host, Gazette Hawkeyes reporter, John Steppy. I'm excited to be joined this week by Waddell Betts, former Hawkeye running back and now the running backs coach for the Hawkeyes. Waddell, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. So we're talking here right before the start of fall camp. So what's your approach to these, especially these first few weeks of fall camp when you have like a year this year, a particularly young group? Uh, I think one of the first things I try to start off with is really just establishing the standard and the expectations. Um, You know, not even talking about on the field play. It's really about off the field for me. You know, things like being on time, making sure you show up ready to work. You know, you're looking attentive. uh, You're ready to take notes. Uh, making sure you're respectful of staff members, of coaches, of your teammates, you know, all those type of things before we even discuss uh, the on-field, you know, adjustments that many of these young guys are going to have to make, especially coming from high school to the collegiate game. So that's a lot of the stuff that I focus on, you know, kind of that initial first week. And then from there on, it's, it's really about the on-the-field stuff. And, and you're talking about making sure they understand the basics of the, of the, of the offense, you know, where to line up in the huddle how to hear the play call, you know, how to get lined up, all those type of little things, the details. How long does it take, like, the typical freshman to pick up on those details? Uh, it varies from person to person. I think early on that first week, you're really trying to establish, like I said, kind of the culture and the standard of expectation in terms of being on time. I think they figure that out pretty quickly um, just by watching the veterans, watching the older guys. You know, make sure you're on time, make sure you're taking notes. They figure that out pretty quick. But the on the field portion, that just varies from person to person. And that could that could take weeks, months. Some guys it could take a year or two. You just don't, you just never really know. There's no exact science to that. And then how do you determine, and this is kind of a post-fall camp question, how many carries to give your first team running back versus second team running back. And I imagine some of it varies year to year, depending on personnel. It does. And um, I'm glad you kind of phrased that in terms of a post fall camp, because really we're so early in the game. I mean, we haven't even started yet. That, that, that's too tough for me to determine right now, but in a hypothetical situation, let's just say we're, we're out of fall camp, like you said, and we're going into a game. It's really about, okay, who is providing us with the most opportunity or the best opportunity, if you will, to uh, continue moving the football and to help win football games. And that's really how you determine it. And more often than not, you're going to need more than one running back. You know, this is an 11, 12 game grueling season. So you need multiple runners, guys that can make things happen. And that pecking order will establish itself coming out of, coming out of camp. And you just you kind of you kind of play with it going into the first game and, and see how it goes from there. Maybe alternate series uh, and see who kind of steps up from there. In a perfect world, in a perfect hypothetical world, is there like a preferred balance of like 70, 30, 60, 40, 50, 50? I guess if you're talking about a perfect world, you'd love to have a 50, 50 situation where you have uh, both guys quite capable of carrying the load both guys quite capable of making plays and winning plays at that. Um, so you just, you really don't know. That can vary from week to week. And it, that's all dependent upon injuries, health, and who's developing and how, how well they're developing. And then you have some interesting recruiting territory. How do you sell a kid from Florida on Iowa, especially when, you know, I think a lot of people from outside <laughs> Iowa have, certain stereotypes about what the state of Iowa is? Uh, I think the easiest way for me to do that or to think about it really is I just provide the information. And what I'm, what I mean is I just provide the information on the program. I think when people do enough research or, or just look into it, and nowadays we have so much social media and everyone has access to the internet, all you have to do is look up Iowa football and you can see that the tradition stands out. The consistency stands out from top to bottom when you're talking about, uh, what, three ADs in, in the last 40, 50 years. I can't remember what the numbers are, but uh, two head coaches in uh, 40 years. That type of consistency is hard to find anywhere. Matter of fact, you probably won't find it anywhere other than Iowa. So those things jump out to people right away once they get that information. And then you see the winning tradition, us going to bowl games, um, us competing for Big Ten championships, 
once they have that information, they then try to make a decision on what, what they're interested in visiting. And when they come, the, the place sells itself. Like you said, people may have preconceived notions or ideas of what they think of Iowa, but until you come here and step foot on the soil and, and walk around and see downtown, you really don't know. And I think most people are pleasantly surprised when they get here because they have the, the information on the football program, which is all positive, right? Mm-hmm. But when they get here and they, they see the, the excitement amongst the fan base, the culture, the community within the school, uh, I, I think it, it, the program sells itself. I guess it's also 72 degrees and sunny always in the weight room. <laughs> it is. It is. It is. The <laughs> facilities definitely don't hurt. And then with that, has NIL come up a lot as you're out recruiting? It doesn't come up as, come up as much as people think. Uh, I know it seems to be a hot topic, I think, on, on TV and social media, but it doesn't come up as much as, as people think. You know, it's something that we're aware of. Um, people do ask questions about it. We do have uh, people in place to handle that type of stuff. So it, it comes up. But it, for me as a coach, that's not something that I dwell on or deal with. I have to give a lot of information about because that's not my area of, of information to give or expertise. Has the collective helped with that when it does come up, having that to share? It does, because like I said, it, it will come up. And I think um, – instead of the players asking us coaches more. So I think when they get on campus, we do have an NIL presentation for the people that are in charge of that stuff. They handle that. Um, so it, it, it comes up and they, and they deal with that. And I think when they see that we have a collective and the idea behind the collective, trying to support the whole instead of um, just particular individuals, I think that's attractive to, to many student athletes and parents as well. What have been your overall takeaways on NIL now we're a little over a year into it? Uh, it's tough to say. It's, it's, it, we're so new into it. It's such a, a mixed bag. I know it garners a lot of reaction from people, some good, some bad. Um, I think it's a good idea in terms of I wish they had it when I was playing, you know, being able to, you know, capitalize on your name, image, and likeness. Then unfortunately they didn't. So I think it's a good idea. It's just about how do you use how do you use that and channel it in the right direction. I think that's what we're trying to do with the collective is make sure we're we're taking care of the whole and not just some. Now take me back to your playing days. If NIL was allowed at that point, what would be like the company that you would most want to have an NIL deal with? Oh wow, that's a tough one. Um, who knows? I mean, High V is always such a big company right here. Maybe High V, but just just the opportunity to have a little extra money in my pocket back when I was playing. I, you know, I come from the days just like many many guys that have come through this program, where you know you you get you get a little money from your stipend from your scholarship, but it's it's hardly enough to to get you by through the month. So it would have always been nice to been able to have a extra, little extra pocket change, a little more for Pancheros or whatever. Absolutely. Get get out and get you something to eat, actually, every now and then. <laughs> and then I realize that's kind of a shared responsibility between you and Abdul with the fullbacks. But how important are they to what you want to accomplish, the fullbacks, with what you want to accomplish in the running game at Iowa? I think fullbacks are somewhat of a unsung heroes, if you will, kind of a, a lost art, some, uh, a position that's somewhat getting phased out by a lot of programs. But here at Iowa, we still we still have a, a traditional fullback. And I think they kind of provide that that um, element of physicality and versatility where you can use them in the run game as an extra blocker, somebody that can be physical, open up some running lanes, but you can also use them uh, in the passing game as well. So I, I think that versatility allows us to be versatile as an offense. And I think when we've had good fullbacks, just like we have this year with uh, Potterbaum kind of heading up that group, it makes us more effective as an offense. Why do you think other schools have really phased that out? I just think uh, a lot of teams are going to the spread. You know, that's, that seems to be a common theme in high school football, uh, and it seems to be a common theme in, in college football too. And we're still one of the programs that kind of run a, a little bit of multifaceted offense. We're not just spread, and we're not just I formation either. We do a little bit of everything. So we still utilize the fullback. Um. So recruiting wise, then when you have a lot of the high school programs not really having fullbacks as much as they used to, 
I'm assuming that to some extent then becomes, okay, who that's already in the building could maybe get moved to full back. You're absolutely correct in that. Um, it's not really positioning we go out and I've only been here. This is only my second year. So in fairness, um, I, I don't think it's really a position that we go out and necessarily recruit and really look for. It's more so a body type uh, that we may have in the building or someone we are, we've identified it at another position. It may, it may be a linebacker, could be a running back that, that, that is looking for more playing time and maybe he can contribute in this arena, stuff like that. So we kind of look inside the building at, at some of the body types and athletes that we already have to kind of fill that role. And then take me back to, let's see, that would have been 2021 when you get the call from Kirk Ferentz offering the running backs coach position at your alma mater. <laughs> it was, it was a good day. I was <laughs> definitely excited. I, uh, I, I applied for the position, went through all the, the rigors of trying to attain the position. So when he finally called and told me that uh, I, I was the choice, I was excited. Uh, my, my, my wife was excited for me. She knew it was something I, I really wanted. Uh, so it's good to be back. You know, it's always, it always feels good to come back to where it kind of all started. You know, but this isn't the same Iowa of old. You know, when I was here, you know, 97, I got here in 1997, I think 98, 99, we had some rough years. And then we kind of got it turned around when Coach Ferentz uh, got a chance to really put his imprint on things. So, and ever since then, they've been rolling. So this is, this is a program that has been rolling for years. Uh, the bubble's not here anymore like it was when I was there. We've got new, <laughs> brand new facilities. So it's an exciting place, and I'm glad to be a part of it. And it, it, it helps when I can go out and sell something that I believe in uh, and something that I help contribute to as well. So it's, it's a good feeling to be back. Do you get reminiscent of the bubble? <laughs> you know what? I, I, I hate to say it, but I'm, I'm glad the bubble's gone. These guys will have to experience <laughs> that turf. That hard turf used to uh, wasn't too forgiving on our on our joints and on our uh, skin either. If we fell on it, so I don't I don't miss the, I don't miss the bubble. <laughs> Do you remind them of how nice they have it? All the time, all the time. <laughs> you know, I look at I, I mean down the little things where like you just you just brought up the bubble. You know, they they have no idea about that or practicing on astral turf, or even um, uh, during my tenure here, the walk-ons didn't get to eat. Uh, team meals together with the, with the uh, scholarship players. That's something that's different. So there's so many things that, that the players have available now that, that we didn't, and we didn't know any better. We, we thought it was the best thing in the world back then, but you realize <laughs> uh, things evolve and things change for the better. So you've been in Kinnick then from your playing and coaching days many times. What was the loudest environment? Ooh, good question. I, I'd probably have to say, Penn State this past year. Wow, um, that that was that was a loud one because you have to you have to. I'll take you back a little bit. Like I said, in ninety eight ninety nine, we didn't have a bunch of winning games, so I can't say this place was rocking and rolling like that during my tenure. We started winning some games my my senior year, so there were some loud games and some loud moments there. But um, this this past year at Penn State night game with the fans, you know, the yellow and black in the stands, it was it was electric. It was electric. Could you hear yourself think on that? I imagine they had to get a little difficult with the headsets. It, it, it became very difficult, especially in that fourth quarter. When we threw that pass to, I believe it was, uh, was it Charlie or was it um, Nico? Nico. Nico Regani. Yeah, and we threw the pass Nico. I think you could only hear yourself inside your head. You couldn't hear anything <laughs> else after that. And then you were, if I'm thinking of the timing right, you were teammates with LeVar Woods, right? I was for, uh, so I was here four and a half years, but yes, I was, I was teammates with him for three of those. Yeah. So what was he like as a player? <laughs> LeVar was intense. He's about as intense <laughs> as he is as a coach. Uh, so not much has changed there. Uh, just the maturity level, right? But uh, no, LeVar, LeVar was great. He was, he was, he was, a, I considered him a friend back then. I consider him a friend now. Uh, it was fun. To, it was fun to play alongside him. And it's even more fun to coach alongside him now to kind of see that evolution and, and see what he's become. It's, it's great. He's one of the best in the business, what he does. Any funny stories about him? Oh man, I can't, you know, I, I, I was thinking about this. I can't think of any specific stories about LeVar, but the one thing that always sticks out about LeVar that, that I can remember are those shoulder pads that he had on, <laughs> you know, everyone wore them back then. Everyone had the oversized shoulder pads and, 
especially if you play defense, which LeVar played defense. Um, he had the big oversized shoulder pads with the neck roll on the back, uh, just kind of like swallowing up his whole body. That's all I remember about LeVar. <laughs> him wearing the 97 with the, with the oversized shoulder pads. Do you look back with him of those playing days or does that, are you a little occupied with what's happening present day? <laughs> a little bit of both. I mean, we're always occupied. We, we stay busy, but um, I'd be lying if I said we don't sit around and talk and joke about uh, some of the things that, that may have happened in practice or particular guys or stories, you know, I mean, just little things that you think of along the way and, and really how far this program has come over the years. Uh, so yeah, we, we reminisce a little bit. <laughs> and then over the years, whether it was during your playing time at Iowa and then in the NFL, it seems like you've learned from a lot of different coaches. Any one of them in particular that really had an impact on you? I would say during my professional career, um, it would be Coach Gibbs. You know, I had a, I had a chance to play for a Hall of Fame coach and I, and really probably played for two Hall of Fame coaches. I'm sure Coach Ferentz would go down the Hall of Fame one day as well. But um, I had a chance to play for Coach Gibbs in the NFL. And uh, it was unique because when I first got to the NFL, um, we weren't a very good team. We weren't very good at all. Much like my, my college team, we weren't very good uh, early on. And then Coach Ferentz came along. And I guess why I said he'll be a Hall of Fame one day. He's come along and changed this whole culture and changed this whole thing. And same thing with Coach Gibbs. He kind of restored that um, – that professionalism, that tradition that that Washington was accustomed to having. So there was a lot of things I took away from Coach Gibbs and and, and how he did things and how he um, how he ran his team. Well, thanks. I really appreciate the time right before fall camp here. I appreciate you having me on. And thanks to our listeners for tuning in to another episode of the Hawk Off the Press podcast. I'll be back with another episode next week. Until then, we will talk Hawks later. Oh, 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 oh,